Now I'm reminded of how Jesus said that he could do nothing of himself except he only says what he hears the father saying and does what he sees the father doing and in reference to that he was speaking of the spirit of God and if Jesus needed the spirit of God why would we think that we need any less there are so many times we make decisions in our life and we don't even ask the spirit of God we don't even ask God we just do what we want and expect God to bless what we're doing last I checked he was God and we're not Would you just stand to your feet, hold, your, hold both hands in the air and say, Spirit, breathe. We need the Holy Spirit more than you have ever, more than we have ever needed him before in our lives. Spirit of God, breathe upon your people, O oh fa oh Father. Not just in this place, Father, but wherever your people are gathered together in your name, Father. Even if we might be separated by different locations, Father. We know, Father, that when we gather together in your name, even streaming over the internet, Father, your word says that there you are in the midst of them. And your word says, Lord Jesus, you said that anything they ask in your name, it shall be done. Lord, we need your presence in our lives. Father, we need your power. Father, we are useless without you. We need you more than ever before, God. Breathe on the Spirit of God and have your way, Father. In Jesus' name. Now give the Lord a praise and thank him for who he is. Amen. Are you are, are y'all tired? Are y'all tired? That sounded like a tired praise. Would you give God some praise? Like, like you know that he's given you the strength. That you know that you can do all things through Christ who has given you strength. You know that God is, if it had not been for him, that you would not be here today. If you know that it is only by God's grace that you have life in your body, you should not hold back your praise from him. My God, you are worthy of all praise and glory and honor thank you father for who you are lord hallelujah you know some people think ah that's all emotion that's all emotion <laughs> we'll see how not emotion you are uh, if someone ever gave you a million dollars <laughs> and if you can praise and get happy for money then why can you not get happy and get emotional about what God has done for you in your life are, are, are y'all with me in here in this <laughs> I want to talk to you about something that the Lord has placed on my heart to share with y'all open your Bibles with me to Hosea chapter 11 Hosea chapter 11 we're going to open up with this scripture, Hosea chapter 11, verse 7, and, and then open your Bibles also, just skip over a few more pages over to the prophet Jonah. We're going to be going into the book of Jonah, and when we get to Jonah, I want you just to hold your Bible open there because we'll be going into different parts of this amazing story. And when I say story, I don't mean just like a fairy tale, I mean <laughs> history. But we're going to talk about the dangers of running from God. The dangers of running from God. In fact, that's the title of my message today. The title of the message is this, the dangers of running from God. It is very dangerous for you to run from God. I believe that there are some people here today and, or over the internet on this live broadcast right now that are running from God. You once knew him, but you backslid and away from him. God is calling you to come back to him because as long as you continue to run, you are a dangerous person. You're dangerous because God is trying to get a hold of you. And when God has a calling on your life, God will go to great extents to get you back to him. Can you say amen? And even if you've been living for the Lord for a while now, you also need to know the dangers of ever thinking that you would backslide against God or turn your life away from him. And so 
we need to understand this so that we will not make that decision to go after some temptation or go after something that, that will pull us away from God. We want to remain faithful to him to the end. Can you say amen? Let us open up in prayer. I usually go into scripture, but we're going to open in prayer because I believe that the Lord wants to teach. I have this teaching spirit on me right now. The Holy Spirit wants to teach. And so I want to just open up with prayer as I believe that he is the teacher. I never want to just come across and share what I've learned over the years or what, what my information. I want to be able to share with you what the Lord is saying. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for who you are, O oh God. We never take for granted the privilege of which you have given us, Father. To be in your presence, Father, to hear from you, Father. Lord, your word is alive, Father God. It's not, it's not, just, it's not just something that... <laughs> It's not just something that is uh, full of information. You see, the difference between a lie, L-I-E, and alive is there's a V in there. And so if something is spoken to you and that V to me represents victory, that gives you no victory, it's a lie. But if it's something that is spoken into our life and gives us victory over death, hell, and the grave, it gives us victory over the enemy, then it becomes alive. And the Bible is alive and is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is able to pierce and go deep with inside of us and bring us into where you desire us to be, O oh God. So, Lord, we pray that you speak. Spirit of God, breathe, Father. We need you to breathe on us, Father, more than we need to take the next breath of air into our bodies, Father. Father, I pray that your anointing be upon me, Father. Lord, because I cannot in my own self, Father, properly communicate, Father, the word and the message in which you desire to deliver to your people on my own, Father. I need you, Lord, to speak through me. You are the comforter, but you're also the convictor. Conviction is good because it just speaks of convincing, Father. And we pray, Lord, I pray that you would convict and convince your people, Lord, of our need for you, Father. If there is a man or a woman that is running from God, believe me that the Lord has given me this word to speak into your life today. He's calling for you to come back to him. Don't ignore the call. As we can see, the time is running out. And Father, we want to be ready for you, Father. So, Lord, breathe upon us and speak to us today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, there are some people, and I, I'm going to be going into Hosea. You can just hold it there. But there are some people and even Bible teachers. There's some pastors today. It will actually teach you that uh, the word backsliding is not even in the Bible. And to that I say you've never read your Bible then. Because it's all over the Bible. Backsliding is all over the Bible. In Hosea 11 verse 7 it says this. For my people are bent on backsliding from me. Even though they call me the most high, none, of them none, of, none at all exalt him. None at, all, none at all exalt God. They, they, they call him God, but they don't exalt him as God. NLT says it this way, for my people are determined to desert me. When you backslide, you're turning your back on God. It means like you're trying to bow out. You're trying to slide right out and, and, and get out quickly without being noticed. You're, you're backing out and you're turning your back on God. He said, my people are bent on this. They're, they, it's like they're prone to it. It's like, like, like no matter what I do for them, they always seem to turn their backs on me and slide away from me. They backslide. And, and, and so he says, they, they, they're determined to desert me. And they call me the most high, but they don't truly honor me. You know, our kingdom-driven youth are learning about the prophet Jeremiah. And in his message to God's people... Oh, Lord, Jeremiah brings up backsliding several times. Jeremiah 14 and 7. Oh, Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do it for your name's sake, for our backslidings are many. And we have sinned against you. Jeremiah 5 and 6. Because their transgressions are many, their backslidings have increased. And the thing that we need to realize is that most people backslide, not in the bad times. We think that most people fall away from God when things get bad, but it's exactly the opposite. Most people fall away from God when things are good. 
Oh, l- let me tell you, p- people fall away from God when things are good because uh, the more, in fact, the more blessed you are, the more prone to fall away from God you are. Because people tend to think that when they have whatever they need, if they have enough money or if they have enough power or prestige, that all of a sudden they forget the God who brought them there and the God who blessed them there. And then all of a sudden they turn their back on God because they got what they actually came to God to get. A lot of people try to use God. They use God to get what they're actually after. And so many times they'll seek God and God, I need this. God, I need you to do this for me. God, I need this from you. But the moment that God answers, we no longer seek him. I'm reminded of when um, the Lord spoke a message to Pastor Cassie and said, when I lift this pandemic, are you going to seek me like you sought me then? Will you read your word then when I lift this whole pandemic and, and everything seems to go back to normal? Or will you seek me as you sought me then? And this is what we need to understand is while things are hard right now and while things are a little difficult right now, people are seeking the Lord. But are you going to continue seeking him when things get good? Because when you turn away from God, when things get good, it's not called blessed. It's called using God to serve your real master. See, God says through Jeremiah in, this, in the same chapter, 5 verse 7, he says, How can I pardon you? For even your children turn against me. They've sworn by gods that are not, are not gods at all. Watch this. I fed my people until they were full. I fed them till they were full. They were not hungry. I I satisfied them, he said. I've, 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 I've filled them until they were full, and they thanked me by committing adultery and lining up at the brothels. In other words, I, he, he, he says, uh, when, when, when I filled them to fullness, that's when they turned on me. So this teaches us that a backslider is a person who has tasted the goodness of God and then have turned away from God. For Hebrews 4, or Hebrews 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 4 through 6, warns us and says, For it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who are once enlightened. And I want you to hear what, 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 what the Lord is going to speak to you, because this is, this is something that it, it is very important that you hear what he's trying to say. And there's a message that the Lord gave me in this very scripture that I need to release after I read it. Watch what it says. It says, for it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened. Those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit. Who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come. Who then turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance by rejecting the Son of God. They themselves are nailing him to the cross. They're bringing reproach to him once again and holding him up to public shame. Now, if you're hearing this and you're saying, well, that's me. And so, Pastor, you know what? Uh, what good is it for me to turn to the Lord now? I once knew him. I once served him. But, but, but you know, you just said it's impossible to, to repent, to come back to God. I mean, what, what, what chance do I have? I mean, what, what's the sense? And this is what the Lord wanted me to share with you. The very reason that he gave me this message was because he's trying to call you back to him before it's too late. Because if you remain where you are and you continue running from God, don't expect for your former faithfulness to cover you. Don't expect that what you used to do for God is going to cover you for where you are today. A backslider is one who once committed their life to God and walked in holiness and loved the word of God. And even could be, could have been a gentle and a kind person and a caring person, but has now grown cold and no longer spends time in the word of God. And their passion and fire is gone. And the Lord says to Jeremiah that your own backsliding will rebuke you and correct you. Jeremiah 2 and 19 says this, for your own wickedness will correct you. Your and your backslidings will rebuke you. 
Know therefore and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God and the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord of the Lord God of hosts. Can I tell you that it is a very dangerous thing to turn your back on God? It is a very dangerous thing for you to walk away from the God who has brought you into where God is, where, where he has brought you into. You know what's funny about these kind of messages? And, 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 and it's funny because a lot of husbands, and I remember being there at one time, a lot of husbands, I don't know what it is about husbands, but, but a lot of husbands think that the wives called me up before service and told me to get their husbands. And I was like, you were talking about me? I remember, I remember when I first went to church and, 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 and it felt like the pastor was looking at me. And it's like, you called the pastor up. You told him everything about me. And, 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 and now he is preaching at me. <laughs> I assure you that your wife did not call me. That's called Holy Spirit. Amen. Let the Lord speak to you. Amen. No better illustration of this truth of backsliding than the prophet Jonah. Turn with me in your Bibles to Jonah. We're, we're, we're just going to open up to Jonah. I'm going to be going in and out of Jonah. Jonah, small book, but a powerful message, four chapters long. Jonah, one of the famous stories we tell our children about. Jonah got swallowed by a whale. But whether it was a whale or a fish, hey, something swallowed him. <laughs> Amen, and he came back. <laughs> But we're going to be going into different parts of Jonah. See, Jonah is a man of God. He had once been so close to God that he could receive a message from God. See, you, in order for him to receive a message like this, like what he received from God, Jonah had to be close enough to God to hear him this way. For him to go to an entire city, to minister to a city, and to call him to repentance, Jonah had to be walking with God. And so Jonah heard the word of God. And, and, and we understand that, 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 that he, he was called to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is in Assyria. And, and they were known as the enemies of, of Israel and, 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 and the people of God. A fun fact that you might not know about Jonah is Jonah served the prophet Elijah. Wait, Pastor, but I thought Elisha was Elijah's apprentice or a successor. And he was, but... Uh, if you remember that on Mount Carmel, which was before Elisha came, there was a servant that was with Elijah in whom he sent up the mountain or the hillside to go see if there was a rain cloud. And rabbis teach that this was none other than Jonah. And they had met at Zarephath. You remember the story of the widow at Zarephath because this is, Jonah was this widow's son. And they teach this because, and, and you can look this up in, in, in the Jewish uh, encyclopedia, you'll find that Jonah was in fact this, the, 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 the son of the widow of Zarephath. And, and he had spent time with Elijah during this famine. Um, and he had experienced when Elijah came that the oil and the flour did not run out. And so already God was already moving. Um, but this was the same boy who died and was then raised back to life through the power of God um, that was upon the prophet. And, 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 and the reason that they teach this is because this husband, the husband of the widow from Zarephath, his name was Amittai. Amittai. Amittai was a sailor and he would spend much time on the, on, on the sea. And Jonah 1, chapter 1, verse 1 says this, now the Lord, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of who? Amittai. Saying, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for the wickedness has come up before me. So not only did Jonah witness the power of God to raise the dead in his own life, but Jonah also witnessed the fire from heaven coming down on Mount Carmel and totally taking all of that, all, all of that altar. He saw where Elijah, one prophet, was able to stand against an entire city, an entire nation, and proclaim the word of God. 
He saw how God, how th this prophet of God um, would get down on his knees and began rocking in a fetal position, praying for rain to come. And he himself climbed to the mountain and saw nothing. And seven times he did this until finally he said, I saw a cloud the size of a man's hand. But what good would that do? All of these things Jonah witnessed. Jonah was a man of God. He knew God. But when God told him to go to Nineveh, verse 3 says, But Jonah arose and he f to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, and he paid the fare and went down into the hold. It's the, the, the Bible says he went down into the hold and, and got with to, to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. I want you to notice twice what it says here. It says that he wasn't just running from his calling. He was running from the presence of the Lord. See, Jonah, when you're running from what God is calling you to do, many people run from God. Don't want to do what God's called them to do. And, 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 and many times we'll try to run away from God because we know that God is going to keep speaking to our hearts. And Jonah said, I got to get away from God. And so he ran in the, the Bible says that he ran in the opposite direction, headed to Tarshish. But let me tell you that you can try to run all you want. You can go as far as far can be. But truth is, is you cannot run from God. Especially when you have a calling on your life. Listen to what David said. David said this in Psalms 139 and 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I send into heaven, you're there. And watch this. Even if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Well, pastor, I, I, I got to disagree with you because, you know, there are many times that I'm asking God to, to show up in my life and I don't feel him. The, 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 the thing that you got to understand is that just because you can't feel him doesn't mean he's not there. What, what often happens, is, and this is what Isaiah also teaches us, that, that it's not that God's arm is short that he cannot reach you, nor his ear deaf that he cannot hear you. It is your sins that are separating you from you. And so because of a dissimilarity in you and God, even though God's presence is there, you cannot feel him. So it doesn't matter where you go. In fact, the Bible says that all of the universe cannot hold God. God is everywhere. He's everywhere. Sobering thought because there are a lot of people who think that they can hide from God. And think that God doesn't see what they do. And <laughs> are, are you all with me here? Yes. And so it's important for us to understand that Jonah was, his running from God was futile. It, it, was, it, it, it was all for nothing. You cannot run from God. But Jonah was insistent. And the Bible says that he went to Joppa and then he boarded a ship and headed to Tarshish. Tarshish was known for great wealth and prosperity and success and even power. And, and it, was, it was in the opposite direction of where God was sending Jonah. And can I tell you that there are many people today who have gone in this direction uh, to where they left God for prosperity. They left him for success and they left him for power, pursuing after great wealth. And, but pastor, do, are you trying to say that God doesn't want us to have wealth? Are you trying to say that God doesn't want us to prosper? Because I, I, I clearly heard in the Bible where it says, and, and many pastors, will bring up these scriptures of saying that does not the Bible say that God will prosper us even as our soul prospers? Yes, it does. But God never allows you to choose prosperity over leaving him and disobeying him. So many people have boarded the ship to Tarshish. Running from God, heading in the opposite direction. So God, just because someone has money or great wealth doesn't mean that you sin it. God doesn't have a problem with people having money. He has a problem when money has people. 
And when we are willing to pursue, when we're willing to do more for money than we're willing to do for God, guess who you're serving? And besides, even if you had all that great wealth, what does it matter to God if you're not even using it for the kingdom? Woohoo, one day you stand before God, God, look at all the wealth that I uh, uh, acquired. He's like, yeah, I blessed you with it so you could bless my people. What did you do with what I've given you? Mm-hmm. So many people have boarded this ship to Tarshish and run from God. The Bible says that Jonah paid his fare, boarded the ship, and went down into the hold, into where, the place where they would hold their cargo. He went down in there, and they got tucked in an area and fell asleep. Can I tell you that no matter how far you go, no matter how deep you go, no matter, even if nobody else sees where you are, God does. And verse 4 says this, but the Lord threw a hurricane, a powerful wind over the sea and caused a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Oh, let me tell you that when you have a calling on your life and you are running from God, God will send a storm to come after you because God wants to try to get a hold of you before the devil does. But here's the truth. One backslide. I want you to understand this. One backsliding man. Cause an entire sea to experience a storm. And what does this teach us? Your decisions never just affect you. So before you start reasoning through your, your decisions to ruin your life and thinking that and telling yourself that, well, it's only, it's only affecting me. It's only affecting me. Know this, that your decisions never only affect you. I have so many people say, well, this is my life. This is my life and I'm only hurting myself. Can I tell you that's a lie from the devil? Because your decisions never just affect you. They affect your family. They affect your friends. They affect everyone around you. That's why we keep on saying, if you won't do it for you, then do it for the people around you. I mean, look at the COVID, this COVID pa pandemic. If you decide that even if you get sick, that, uh, you know, your immune system is strong enough for you to handle, lucky you. So you don't sanitize your hands. You don't wash your hands well. <laughs> you don't even wear your mask correctly. You know, all those people walking around with the mask, not covering their nose. <laughs> but you know, Pastor, I can't breathe, Pastor. <laughs> and all of a sudden you get sick. Well, guess what? You just shut your entire house down for two weeks. Because now, because now you got to be in quarantine. Nobody can go to work. Nobody can infect anybody else. Your one decision of getting sick brought it into your home and infected your entire house. And Lord forbid that anyone in your household has underlying uh, health situations or conditions uh, that would put them at risk or even ca cause them to be hospitalized or Lord forbid, even death. But hey, you can't breathe with your mask on, right? Your decisions never just affect you. So you understand this. Your life is never just your own. See, Jonah was on a merchant's route. And so there was more than just one ship that was on the sea at that time. And all of them were experiencing this same storm because one man chose to backslide from God. So in verse 5 it says, fearing for their lives, the, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help. And threw, even through the cargo overboard, the whole reason why they were on that sea, they had to jettison it all, get rid of it all, to lighten the ship. But all this time, Jonah was where? Sleeping. He was sleeping down in the hold. While all of this commotion was going on, Jonah was sleeping. <laughs> I 
You see, these were seasoned sailors. They had spent their life on the sea. So they knew that this was a storm of all storms, meaning that it was not caused by natural causes. This was something supernatural. So they had to start turning to their gods. or They had to find some reason why they were facing what they were facing. When people begin to panic, they start to turn to all kinds of things. And the only one who had the answer for what was going on in their life was sleeping. The only one who give, who give them an answer for what was happening was sleeping. So they get out their idols and they start praying to their false gods. And nothing happens. In fact, it says that the storm continued to worsen. And, and yet... The only one who knew what was actually, could have told them what was actually happening, was sleeping. And God wanted me to tell you today, man, a woman of God, it's time to wake up. Because you carry the answer to the problem that people have today. And I'm not talking about the, the, the answer to COVID. I'm talking about their eternal problem. Because if you know God, then you have the answer. To what every person is looking for in this life. It's amazing that when things go bad. That people stop looking to what is natural. And start looking to what is supernatural. And it becomes a perfect opportunity for you to share <laughs> the Lord with them. Somehow even through all the commotion. All the commotion. Through, the, through, through them all coming down and grabbing all the cargo. Jonah was still sleeping. He didn't hear any of it. Didn't hear the storm. Didn't feel the rocking of the ship. Didn't hear them all the commotion going on. This man of God was sleeping. Totally oblivious to what was going on around him. But can I tell you that it wasn't because Jonah was just lazy and it wasn't because he was just tired. No, this sleep was the exhaustion of a man who's running from God. No doubt that he had been at sea for a while. This was not no one day trip. This was a, a se several weeks or, or at least two week, uh, three week uh, trip to go to Tarshish. And, 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 and so no doubt he had been on the sea for a little while. And, 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 and no doubt that while he was there, he had become weary because the thoughts that come into your mind when you have a heavy conscience. The thoughts of how could I have done this to God? He, I heard the voice of God. How could I turn my back on him? I've ruined everything. I used to hear the word of God. I delivered it to people and they would love me for it. They turned their life to God. But I've ruined everything. I let my mom down. I've let... My pastor's down. I let everybody down. And this was pounding on him so strongly that he finally passed out under the pressure. But can I tell you that God is not just going to let you sleep, especially at a time like this, because there are people that you are called to reach. And yes, he can get somebody else to do it. But can I tell you that this is what the Lord wanted me to speak to you today. Is he's not done with you yet. So let me give you three consequences of a man or a woman who is running from God. Number one is this. It will never only affects you. Pastor, you already talked about this. Yeah, but this is one of my points. It never only affects you. Running from God makes you dangerous. I, I mean, Lord, if you're running from God, I don't want to be around you. Because when God come looking for you, guess what? Everybody around you is going to be affected. If you have a calling from God on your life, and let me tell you, if you have breath in your body, you're called of God. God has a calling for you to fulfill in order to reach your friends and your family and the people around you. So if you turn from God, God coming for you. Can you say Amen. And it never only affects you. How many families are suffering because of disobedience of a father? How many families are suffering because of disobedience of a mother? Or even a child? I mean, Lord, the, look at the effects of addictions on, on families. Look at the effects of, of, of drug addictions on families. 
It tears families apart. And it doesn't just affect the user. It turns the whole, the whole family becomes affected by it. Start doubting God. Start doubting who God is. Get angry, get angry, angry at their parents, angry. The children getting angry at their parents and, 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 and the parents getting angry with each other, angry at God. Your decision never only affects you. Look at King David. He was tempted by the devil to take a census. I mean to count the people. What kind of a sin is counting people? But look at 1 Chronicles 21, verse 1. It says, now Satan, who, who, who stood up? Satan stood up against Israel and he moved David. Look at this. Moved the man after God's own heart to do something. Well, let me tell you, just because you saved does not mean you are uh, immune to the attacks of the enemy. Are you all with me here? Satan stood up against and moved on David to number Israel. Why? Well, because David wanted to see how successful he was forgetting that the whole reason why he came for that moment just for that moment he forgot why how, it was that it was God who brought him into it and this is what happens to a lot of people is and, and why you always have to remain humble and why you always have to remain thankful to God why work this is why worship is so important because it reminds you who's really the one who, who has brought you to where you are but the moment you forget that is the moment that you start moving into a place, a very dangerous place. And so David demanded Joab, his chief officer, to go and count all of Israel. And even Joab, even Joab, I mean, Joab was a wicked man. This brother, oh. But even he turned to David and said, this is a sinful thing you're doing. But David didn't care. David wanted to know how successful he was. And so he says, you know what? Let's test our strength. I want you to go out and count how much soldiers we have out there. Give me a count to know how successful we are. And because he was lifted up in pride, the Lord brought judgment upon Israel. And 70,000 men, not 7,000, 70,000 men lost their lives because one king chose to turn his back on God for a moment. So understand this, the decisions that you make never only affect you. Number two, the world is going to rebuke you. Jonah 1 and 6, it says this, so the captain went down after him and asked him a question he said how can you sleep at a time like this shouted get up and pray to your god maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives hear this heathen man doesn't even know god is telling the prophet that he should be praying that's like somebody walking up to a Christian and saying, hey, why aren't you praying? Don't you see what's going on here? Why aren't you praying, Christian? Christian, don't, uh, don't you believe in God? But you're not even praying to ask your God to save us? We don't spend no time asking God to help us to reach our friends, to reach our, lo our, our loved ones, reach our coworkers. We, 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 the, the world, when you're turning from God and when, you're, when your mind is, set, is so set on everything else, that, that, that literally the world will rebuke you. I thought you were a Christian. I thought, why, why aren't you praying for our salvation? Especially at a time like this. This is no time for sleeping. It's time to seek the face of God. Seek God for those who are perishing. So when Jonah woke up and he felt the ship tossing and turning, he saw the, the ship taking on water. He's like, oh, no, oh, no. He found me. He found me. Finally, Jonah told them that it was all his fault. He said, I'm a Hebrew. I'm a man of God. And I've been running from God. And so they asked him, Jonah, why would you do something like this? Why would you turn your back on God? Was God bad to you? Was he evil to you? Was he mean to you that you would turn your back on God? And Jonah was like, no. I'm running from my calling. God's been good to me. He raised me 
up from the dead. He supplied for me through a famine. I served the man of God. And when it became my turn to go and reach people, I ran from him. The world is going to rebuke you. I mean, has God been that bad to you for you to turn your back on him? What's interesting is because Jonah had turned away from God and had backslid and he lost his authority and he lost his power. He had no power over this storm. No authority. He couldn't speak to the storm. He lost his ability to even understand what was going on. See, the Apostle Paul was in the same exact sea and experienced at a later time, experienced a storm like what Jonah was facing. And in the midst of that storm, watch the difference between a man who is running to God or a man that is with God versus one who is running away from God. Acts chapter 27 verse 22 says, but take courage. None of you will lose your lives even though the ship is going down. We're going to get shipwrecked, but take courage because none of you are going to die in this. For last night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and he said, Do not be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness not only took care of the man of God, it says that God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. Watch this. Just as much as a man who's running from God affects the people around him. A man that is running to God. Oh, I can feel your presence, Father. A man that is running to God will affect the people around him. Your decision either to follow God or to turn your back from God will affect the people around you. You're supposed to know the answer. Because you know the one who has all the answers. So even in the midst of a storm and even though they were going to lose their ship, Paul was still able to give those who were with him a word of encouragement. God has called us that even in the midst of a storm to be able to stand and say, this is what the Lord spoke to me. No one will lose their life if you put your trust in him. That's what the voice of a man or a woman of God is supposed to be, especially in the midst of crisis, especially in the midst of danger. But Jonah had lost the power of his testimony because he was running from God. So the story, this is the story of every, every backslider. You know, they might be able to tell you what God did. Oh, I remember when God did this for me. But because they backslid and they have no power and all of their testimonies have reached their expiration date. I love that, expired testimonies. That's good for you, what God did for you then, but what is he doing with you now? Are y'all with me here? Number three is this, God will allow you to go down if you want to. Well, if God loved me, he's not going to let me go down. Let me tell you, if you really, 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 really want to go down, God will let you go down. He'll even set up a whale or a fish to swallow you. And then that fish will take you down. See, the fish represents the lowest of lows. In fact, Jonah said this in Jonah chapter 2, verse 5. He said, I sank beneath the waves and the waters closed over me. Seaweed. I mean, he had nori. <laughs> nori is uh, uh, <laughs> it's a type of seaweed that we put on our rice here. <laughs> or we cut it up and put it into poke. Yeah. <laughs> this is not a funny situation, okay? He's, he's talking about death and we were laughing about it. <laughs> he had seaweed wrapped around his head. He said the seaweed wrapped itself around me. Then he said I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. And so it means he went down into the lowest, lowest of lows. At the bottom of the sea. And I was imprisoned in the earth. 
whose gates locked shut forever. You know, a lot of people say that Jonah was alive for the three days, but even Jonah says that he died. He said he was on the, well, he was on the verge of death. Maybe that's where you are right now, in the depths of despair. Feel like you're at the bottom of your rope. Feel like you've almost hit rock bottom. I got news for you. When you hit rock bottom, you can't go nowhere but up. So lift up your head. Psalms 121 and verse 1 says this, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence my help comes. My help comes from the Lord. You see, when you finally hit rock bottom, you come to realize that it was the God who brought you to where you are, that you are where you are now because you turn your back on him. So God says, stop looking down, lift up your eyes and see where does your help come from. My help comes from the Lord. That's exactly what Jonah did. Chapter 2 verse 7 says, As my life was slipping away, I remembered, I finally remembered the Lord. And my, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their back on all God's mercy. So, so Jonah was literally reminding himself of the mercy of God. He finally, at the, almost at the end of his life, he finally came to the point where he was like, I remember, God, your mercy. So, Lord, I'm crying out to you. Crying out to you, God. And even in the midst of the belly of this whale, of this fish, I will offer my sacrifices to you. And I'll sing songs of praise. And I will fulfill my vows for my salvation. It comes from the Lord alone, my God. See, when Jonah got his eyes off of where he was and began to worship the Lord. That's why worship is your weapon. This is why when even David was facing what he was facing at Ziklag, where, where he and his men had returned from battle and, and, and a battle that they were even rejected and they weren't even allowed to go into battle because the kings of, of, of the Philistines didn't want no association with David and for David to be able to betray them to get his favor back with Israel because they were at war with Israel. And so can you imagine girding up and everything, getting ready to go to battle and all of a sudden they say, oh, hold up, you got to go home. Uh-uh, we ain't letting, you, you ain't going to fight with us. And to return back home and everything that you had been fighting for was gone. All there was was fire. Your wives, your children, everything you had been fighting for, your homes burnt. My God. And it's a funny thing, even those who are closest to you, when you come to a situation like that, they will turn on you. So even his own men, they cried a cry that caused him to become weak. And he became so discouraged. The discouraged literally means to have your courage taken from you. It's without courage. It means your courage, something in your life is taking your courage from you. So much so that they even talked about killing David. I mean, it's one thing to lose your wives and your children. But then for your own men to talk about killing you now. Where is the hand of God on the anointing that God has placed on my life? They, I can see David saying this. The prophet Samuel, he anointed me to be king. And look, now my own men want to turn to how can I lead Israel if I can't even lead these men? I've lost everything. It's all, it's all my fault. I lost everything. But the Bible says one thing about David. This is why worship is your, is your weapon. Because in the midst of despair, David lifted his eyes up to where his help comes from. And the Bible says that he encouraged himself in the Lord. The word encouraged in 
in, in, in Hebrew literally means to take hold of. You see, when you begin to take hold of God and encourage yourself in the Lord, the Bible says that God encouraged him. And so if you will take hold of God, guess what? God begins to take hold of you. And in the midst of that, st- in the midst of that whale in that fish, some people say whale, some people say fish. The Bible says fish. I'm going to call it a fish. Well, fish don't have oxygen, so how could he survive? They don't. Why are we always trying to scientifically understand the word of God? If God says it, that settles it. Well, I don't understand that. You, don't you know that God's ways are far above your ways? That if God put a bubble in a fish to cause Jonah to remain alive, who's, uh, who are we to say what God, or God, God can or cannot do? When Jonah finally got his eyes off of his situation, got his eyes off of his problem, and began to worship the Lord. The very next verse says, so the Lord spoke to the fish. Can I tell you that the moment you begin to get your eyes off of the problem that you're in and begin to focus on the Lord, that God can speak to your problem? Even if it's a fish. But here's my question to you. (laughs) When Jonah started worshiping the Lord, God spoke to the fish. If you knew, if you knew that there was a praise that would cause God to speak to your problem, why would you allow your mouth to remain silent? If you knew that there was a praise in your mouth that would cause God to speak to your situation, why would you remain quiet? Pastor, that's emotional. (laughs) Let me tell you about emotional. If you knew what God had done for me (sighs) and what he brought me out of, it's okay for you if you want to remain silent, but because what God has done for me, don't please excuse me if I offend you when I praise my God and I lift up my voice and shout to him. The moment he recommitted his life to the Lord and began to worship the Lord, God started speaking to his situation. You want God to start speaking to your situation? Humble yourself before God. Begin to worship and recognize him, and God will speak to the situation in which you're going through. Because here's here's the amazing thing. It tells me that whatever you're going through right now, God doesn't mean it for your demise. He's allowing you time to get back to him. But pastor, I've done too much to be forgiven. How could God ever use me? Well, listen to me, man of God. Jonah 1, 3, and uh, chapter 3, verse 1 says this. When Jonah came out of the whale or the fish, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. We serve a God of second chances and third chances and fourth. My God. I said fourth and I went like this. And fourth chances. <laughs> Pick number three, my Lord. <laughs> and when you just start shouting, you don't even know what your hand's doing. It's just going off. <sighs> let me tell you, man of God, let me tell you, woman of God. The moment you turn your life back to him, <sighs> he can put you right back on schedule. My Bible says that God is able to take whatever the canker worm and all these worms, uh, forget about what kind of worm, it's just something that devours. God is able to restore what was taken from you right back to you the moment you give your life back to him. God took Jonah out of that fish, put him right back on schedule, and put an anointing on him that was able to turn the entire city upside down for God. This anointing was so powerful that it didn't just cause the entire city of people to go on a fast. The Bible says that the animals did too. I have a puppy named Rain. 
We're going on a fast. Guess what, Rain? Rain gonna be hungry. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> let, 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 let's let the Bible teach you. Jonah 3 and 6 says this. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne. My God! That could preach. <laughs> no, that's not going to be my part two. That's Cassie like, oh, you're going to have a part two. I was like, woman, I went all the way to chapter four already. There's nothing else in Jonah to preach on. <laughs> She's trying to rest. <laughs> yeah, we got a little inside thing that was going on on Wednesday night that y'all don't know. I got, I got set up, but hey, God moved, so hey, all glory to him. Y'all don't, don't want the blessings? Hey. That's on you. Be tired. Get a massage. I'm just messing with you. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne. My God, if we would just get off of our thrones. Took off his royal robes. Didn't want to be even associated as a king. Dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Because one man finally turned back to God. It affected the king so much. Listen to what he says. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals from your herds or flocks may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning and everyone must pray earnestly to God. Then you must turn from your, from your evil ways and stop all your violence. Who can tell then? Or perhaps, he's saying perhaps, or, or maybe perhaps even yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. And when God saw that they had what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, look at God. He changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction that he threatened. Revival came to Nineveh. Because one man turned his life back to God. Can I tell you that revival is waiting for you to answer the call? You see, I never know who the Lord has me speaking to. But I do know this, that God is calling some of you. Because we're living in prophetic times. That this is a time when people are coming to know the Lord in ways that I, 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 would, I would pray for. I've been a pastor for over 15 years. And I'm seeing people do things immediately that would take them months before. And some of them would come to the Lord a little, but they still hold on to these things. People are totally casting everything off and coming full force into God. This is the time that we've been praying for. And people sleeping. God is waiting for you to answer the call because there are people that are headed to hell that he has anointed you to reach. But you got to live your life. Now, I believe Holy Spirit's messing with you today. And that's okay because we're going to talk about something. Praise him. Go ahead and start making your way up here. Yes, Pastor Jim's moving to a close. That day in Nineveh, 120,000 people were saved that day. One man turned his life back to God and 120,000 people were saved that day. And we wonder why God sent a storm. Because maybe on that sea there may be, maybe 100 or 200 people there. But 120,000 people were saved an entire city. Nineveh, Nineveh was like the New York City of, 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 of Assyria. Imagine if God called you to go to New York City and that entire city turned its life back over to God. This is what happened with Jonah. And you would imagine that Jonah would be happy with them turning their life back to God. But the Bible says something quite funny about this. Um, because in Jonah chapter 4 verse 1 it says, this change of plans, ho hold up. Revival has come to this city and the prophet of God is angry. Hold up. 
Watch this. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah. Well, let me tell you, you, you need to dig into the Bible because it's not just about Jonah got swallowed by the whale. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in this. I mean, if you just read your Bible, you would learn a lot. <laughs> This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. Why? So he complained to the Lord about it. He said, didn't I say before I left home that you're going to do this, Lord? This is the whole reason why he ran. He said, I ran away to Tarshish because I knew that you are merciful. And you're a compassionate God, slow to get angry. I mean, my God. Look at what happens when a man turns back to God. Okay, watch this. And his heart is not even in it, and he's preaching a word that his heart is not even in, and people can still get saved. Are, are, are you all with me here? His heart was not even in the message he was preaching. He's probably walking around and going, yeah, 40 days from now, Nineveh going to die. Heart not even, it didn't even care about the people, but, it mo but the spirit of God moved so powerfully on, on, on their king and their, their nobles that the entire city repented to God. He complained. He said, I told you this was going to happen, that you a merciful God and, and slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. Uh, I don't understand this. This man of God is complaining about God's mercy and love. Watch why. It says, for you are eager to turn back from destroying your people. Listen to what he says. Just kill me now. Well, you sound like Elijah. Just kill me now, God. This is over. But listen why. He says, I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. I think Jonah spent too much time with Elijah. He just wanted to see him burn. I mean, I, I can just picture it. It says that right after this, Jonah went out outside of the city, and he built him a little shelter, and he just sat there to watch the fireworks. I can just see him pulling out his marshmallows. Yeah, we're going to roast some marshmallows here today, brother. And all of a sudden, God changes his mind. Jonah's angry about it. Some Bible teachers say that the Ninevites or the Syrians were responsible for his father's death. And so because, or because they were the enemies of Israel, Jonah hated them. I mean, just listen to what he says. He says, Lord, I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. In other words, I told them that in 40 days, Nineveh would be overthrown. And if it doesn't happen, then just let me die. If it doesn't happen, then just let me die. I mean, Jonah literally warned them of what would happen. And he sat down outside of the city to watch it burn. What's most amazing to me, and this is what really the Lord spoke to me. The Lord had to deal with, with Jonah. But this is what the Lord spoke to me. What's so interesting to me was that God was more interested in saving a people that were lost. Even enemies of his promised people, of his covenant people. Can I help you to understand something? People of God, God wants to save your enemies. Oh, I know, I know, I know. You want God to teach them a lesson for what they did to you, right? But imagine if you were to turn your life back to God, ask them to forgive you, God would save your enemies. But as long as you're angry with them, here's what's scary. God could actually save them through you and you yourself go to hell. Because you're unwilling to forgive. You're so busy wanting God's destruction to come that when God saves them, you still doubt what God did to them. Are, are, are you all with me here? I'm so amazed that God would be more interested in saving the lost than keeping his word of judgment. That's what amazes me most. God was more interested in saving what was lost than he was in keeping his word of judgment. I can just see the prophet complaining, great now, great, 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 great. Just now no one's going to take me serious. They're all going to think I'm a fraud. They're going to think that I was lying. I, I told them that, 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 that in 40 days that 
the Lord is going to overturn this entire city. Another translation says destroy this entire city. That the Lord is going to bring judgment to this city. And now guess what? If you relent God, then I'm going to look like a fool. Now nobody's going to think, they, um, if I try to tell them anything, they're going to think I'm crying wolf. You missed it. You missed it. You know, it's just like how we've been warning people to be ready. For what's coming. But if God, we've been telling God is about to turn this world upside down. But if God relents, if he tarries, then the world will look at all these prophets and say, you guys lied. But was it a lie? Or did God relent from bringing the judgment he meant if you would just Turn your life back to him. What amazes me most is that God is more concerned in your salvation than he is about breaking his word. Pastor, hold up. I was told that God would never break his word. Really? Jesus is known as a word made flesh and God allowed him to be broken in order to save you. Did y'all get that? Yes. Or sometimes you might lose it in the yelling. So let me just slow it down. God allowed Jesus, who was the word made flesh, to be broken so that we could be saved. Don't tell me God will not allow his word to be broken in order to save your life. But wait, Pastor, does it, does, doesn't the Bible say that God's word will not return to him void, that it will do exactly what it was sent to do, that it will, it, 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 it will not come back to him, that if he sent his word, it's not going to come back to him empty. It's going to do what he sent it to do. Well, then, someone could say that with Jonah and Nineveh, this just proved this whole theory wrong because, you know, God relented from what he said would happen. And so God's word didn't accomplish what it was sent to do, right? And so should then for we who are alive today be afraid of what God has been warning us will come today? That if God didn't have let it happen to Nineveh, maybe God won't let it happen to us? Don't you understand that God's ways are far above your ways? And that God knows exactly what he's doing. You see, the word that came to Nineveh through Jonah in Jonah 3 and 4 was this. On the day that Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be overturned. And it would seem as though this word did not accomplish what it was sent to do unless you know what the original Hebrew means in this word overturn. It is the word havoc. It literally means to overturn, to turn upside down, or even to destroy. But it has a second meaning. It also means to change you completely or to convert you. And so one way or the other, the word of God came to pass. Because the moment you turn your life to Jesus, the old things become havoc. They become changed and they pass away. And behold, all things become new. And so my question for you today is, are you ready to allow God to turn your life upside down? Are you ready to allow God to change you from the inside out? Are you ready to allow God's word to be fulfilled in your life? Are you ready to stop running from God and start answering the call of God? Well, my Bible says this, today is the day of salvation, and now is the time. You're not promised tomorrow. You cannot put this off for another time. Maybe when I feel better about it, then I'll do it. You cannot, you are not afforded that time. All you have is right now. You don't even know if your heart is going to stop today because you are that close to your eternity. You are one heartbeat away from your eternity. And this could be God's last chance for you to get your life right with him before you leave this world. None of us, no matter whether you are good or whether you are evil, are promised tomorrow. We all have have to understand that before God every day that we live is a gift from God 
Just as Jonah did from the belly of the whale or the fish. Wherever you are in your life, it's time to cry out to God to repent for your sins. And instead of running from him, run to him. And you'll find what the prodigal son found about his father. When the prodigal son finally made up in his mind to come back home, it wasn't just that he was running to his father. His father came running to him. The funny thing about running from God is God comes running after you. And my Bible says that God doesn't change. And so if God is running in one direction and you're running away from him, guess what you have to do to turn back to him? Turn around. And you'll find God coming running right for you. Stand to your feet, everyone. My God, I pray that the Lord would speak to hearts and mind today. That he would call those who are running from him to come back to him. And the Lord assured me that he would speak to every heart and mind. So I know that God is speaking to people today. Right now is the time to turn you back to him. You're not promised tomorrow. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not just trying to move your emotions to get you to make a decision. This isn't one of those things where you just make a decision right now and when you go home, change your mind when you get home. What I'm calling you to is a full commitment to turn your complete life over to the Lord. This is a, this is a decision that you have to make and you alone have to make. You, no one can make this decision for you. God is trying to call you back to him. Don't ignore him. While the door is still open and he's still calling out to you. You know what's, what, 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 what scares me is on Wednesday night I have to be a little transparent here. You know we have a new order that is over our state. And with all the confusion that, that was going on with the order... You know, we thought that we could only have five people in the, in, in, in the building and that it was going to restrict us from worshiping God. And I'm there in worship. And w something hit me because it's one thing to worship God at home. And you all can understand what I'm trying to say. It's one thing to worship God at home, <clears throat> but it's a whole other thing to be able to come together with the people of God and worship him. And for a brief moment, I had the thought that this could be the last time I get to come together with God's people and worship him together. And all of a sudden, just by that one feeling of you can lose what you have. My God, this heaviness came over me and I was just trying to take it in as much as I could. The Lord showed Pastor Cassie a vision, and the Lord really speaks to my wife. I'm, tell I'm telling you, I'm, uh, some people are scared of her. They, they run from her. I don't know why you're running from her. She's only telling you what God is telling you, and you can't run from God. But some people think if I run away from the prophet, then I can get away from God. Foolish. The Lord showed her a vision of a day when the church would close. It was a day that the rapture took place and God's people were taken home. And the people who were left behind, who had experienced the presence of God, somehow were able to come into this building. Well, let me tell you, just because you go to church doesn't mean you're safe. Just because you stand in the church building, just because you worship the Lord <clears throat> doesn't mean you're safe. You have to fully commit your life to him. It's not, it's not no, no, no magic trick that you pray some words. But she said she felt this dark dreariness 
It was miserable. Because all these people had when they came back to this house was the memories of what they had experienced God do before. And they had taken for granted the presence of God in their life. I know you're at home right now, some of you. I know if a family that, that you're at home right now. And you never thought that this day would come to where you have to worship the Lord in your homes. We experienced the presence of God move so quick, so powerfully that God would sweep over this entire sanctuary and people be laid out all over the place because of the power of God. We saw demons come out of people. We saw God deliver people from things that, that and, and we saw God open blinded eyes. We've seen God do the miraculous here. And we never thought that we would face a day where the doors would be closed. Just like we never thought that we, when the rapture happens, we'd be left behind. Let me tell you, don't take for granted the life that you have or this very moment that you're standing in right now. That God is not slow to come. He's giving you time to get your life right with him. So I want to pray a prayer with you. We're all going to pray this prayer because it is something that we all need to continually remind ourselves of. Of a commitment that we're making to God. Say one of those uh, New Year's resolutions either where you give up in uh, the first couple of weeks. It's not a Monday diet where you do it for Monday and you stop after that. This is one of those commitments that you're truly making to go all in. Are you all with me here? Yes? And from this moment on, Lord, I totally commit my life to you. I may not know where you're leading me to, but as long as you're with me, I'll do whatever you want me to do. That was my prayer when I, when I committed my life to the Lord. Lord, whatever you're telling me to do, as long as you're with me, I'll do whatever you want me to do, God. I never want to move without him. I never want to step without him. I, 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 I cannot be without God. And I believe that you cannot be without him either. So I want you to pray this prayer and fully commit your heart, your life, everything. Let these words be your heart cry out to God. So everyone bow your heads, no one looking around. I want you to say, God in heaven. Oh, say it like you mean it. Say, God in heaven. I confess that I'm a sinner in need of saving. My destiny was to be in hell for all eternity. That's the reality of it, people. I need you to, you, you need to hear yourself say this. But say, thank you, God, for not leaving me. Because I believe that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to give his life for me so that I can be forgiven of my sins and live with you forever. Father, I ask you to please forgive me of living for myself and living a life of sin. I ask you to wash me clean with the precious blood of Jesus and make me white as snow. And I confess to you, no, I commit to you that from this moment on, I will live the life you've given me for you who gave your life for me. I renounce the things of darkness and the things I used to be involved in. And I commit my life to live for you from this day forward. Jesus, you are my Lord. You are my owner and my Savior. Thank you for saving me.
and for giving your life for me so that I may live for you who gave your life for me. Come into my life through your spirit. Holy Spirit, live inside of me. Lead me and guide me into all truth so that I may fulfill your will. In Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. Now give the Lord a hand clap of praise like you know that he saved you. Because I've been changed. He free. Deliver. Because I found joy.
Somebody needs to hear this on my chest. Hey. Yes. Somebody say sin. Say forgiven. somebody right here because of the decision that you have made to never go back he is healing you right now receive in the name of Jesus I won't go back I can't go back to the way it used to be say before your presence came and come on say said to me right now that he is breaking every generational curse of your families and your family's family and your children because of your decision that you are making as a head of household that you will go back to God and give your life over to God your families is blessed you are blessed your children is blessed their children is blessed somebody praise the Lord say it I won't go back come on make that decision mother the Lord said keep on pressing keep on believing keep on having faith in me he said said the Lord and he will fulfill all that you are you are praying for right now in the name of Jesus he said praying mother you keep on pressing you keep on praying you keep on believing and he will fulfill all that you're praying for right now in the name of Jesus saying
you know how much how many Jeremiah generations is on here right now do you understand what I'm saying do you know how many Jer Jeremiah generations is right here on this live listen to me I want to speak to you I want to speak to you this morning really quickly to every one of you youth, to every one of you now generation, to every one of you teens, you're making the decision not because of your parents said so. You're making the decision because you have a future. Because God has promised you a future, pastor. God has promised you a future, apostle. God has promised you a future, apostle, uh, prophet of God. God has promised you a future, a counselor, a businessman. God has promised you a future. And the decision that you're making today has nothing to do with your parents, but has everything to do with your desire, your wants, your wills. You love God that much. So make that decision right now in the name of Jesus. Sing. decision right now, thanks of God. Make that decision right now in the name of Jesus. Make that decision right now in the name of Jesus. this morning the Lord said don't just say the words live the words my God he said don't just say the words live the words don't just sing it live it I want you to lift your hands right here all over this place right now live the word live the word only a few will make it will you be that few in the world live the word he has fulfilled so many things inside of you he has fulfilled so many things in your homes he has he has shown you himself but he said to tell you and those that is on the live today, do you believe what you say when you say, I'm never going back. I'm never going back. I'm never going back to the way it was. Hey, yes. I'm never going back. Do you believe that? I'm never going back. I'm never going back to the way it was to the way it used to be to the way it used to be do you believe that this morning do you believe that this morning saints of God do you believe that this morning he's speaking to you he's speaking to me He's speaking to the world. He's speaking to those that is on the live. No one is, ex is exempt. Nobody is exempt here. No matter how, what title we carry and how much we read the word, none of us is exempt here. He's coming back for his bride without spot and wrinkle. 
But do you believe that this morning? That you will never go back to Egypt. You'll never go back to the place of slavery, to the place of bondage, to the place where you was prisoned by your own sinful nature. You're making a decision that you will never go back. That I choose blessings over cursings. I choose blessings. I choose life over death. I'm choosing life over death for myself and for my family. Is that what you're choosing this morning? And if you say, Pastor, I was just going through the motions. If that is you this morning, get off that train that motion train where I'll just do because everybody else is doing it. Get off that train and get on the God train. Do you hear what I'm saying, saints of God? He can come right now. He can come right now this moment. And it's time to get on the God train. Because he's moving faster than the eyes can see, quicker than the minds can imagine. He's searching the hearts of his people. And to Renee, I want to be, and I'm speaking for myself, but I want to be the person that says, I will not go back to where I was. I will never go back into that pit again. I will never go back to that slave being a slave of sin again I will never go back there and the question to you when you make a decision you stand on your decision you stand on God or you stand without God because without God you're going to fail you're going to fall you're going to be left behind but when you are remaining when you remain standing on God there's nothing left to do but to go forward. But it's as if you're standing on solid foundation. If what you're standing on is sinking sand. Just because I made a, I made a decision today, but in my heart I didn't truly mean it, Auntie Renee. You see, God is looking for those that say... I heard your word. I don't want to be the prodigal daughter. I don't want to be the prodigal son. I don't want to be left behind. I want to make a difference. And that's the attitude that we all should have. We want to make a difference because your household can change. Your household can be saved. Your children can, your children don't have to follow the things that you had to follow. You did before. They don't have to repeat the same cycle. That's why we say, if he can't do it for you, my God, then do it for somebody you love. And hopefully in that process, you'll find God. But don't let your children repeat the cycle in which you, where you were before. Are you listening to me, faith in action? God is life. And when he begins something in you, he fulfills it. But he cannot fulfill it if you don't give him the right to. Because how many of you know that we have to give God the right and the access to our bodies? Yes. Pastor, can he have his way? Isn't he God? Absolutely. He's God. But he ain't a pushover. And I tell you this. He wants to see if you really mean what you said this morning. Living for God is not easy, but let me tell you this. It's worth it. You'll get beat down. And let me tell you, when you're living for God, you'll get back up. That's the promises of God. But when you're not in God, you get beat down and you'll stay down. Because you're not in God. But when you're in God, you get beat down, 
The weight of the world will be heavy. Things will be, come at you left and right. But you'll get back up. He said, I, Jesus said, I have to leave. So that someone even greater will come. And that someone who is greater is the very presence of the living God that's standing there right in front of you. The very presence of the living God is inside of you supposed to be. And the question to you this morning, and I am done, is where is he? Is he in you? Or do you just follow him when you want to? You know, if he goes to Walmart, I'll go to Walmart. But if he goes to Target, I ain't going to Target because I can't stand Target. But wherever he go, the attitude of a true disciple, my God, in the name of Jesus. Yes, God. The attitude of a true disciple is where you go, I go. Where you go, God, I'll go. What you do, I'll do. What you do, Father, I will do. What you say, I will say. Whatever you want me to do, God, I will do for you. That is a true disciple. A disciple. Makes the decision. He can. He can go back if he wants to. You can. But a true disciple says that's filth. It's not pleasing to my Savior. It's not pleasing to the Lord of my life. It's not pleasing to him. A true disciple makes decisions. That many times you don't even understand at that moment. But my God, you understand it in the end. A true disciple stands on the word of God. And I end with this. I had someone who said to me a few days ago, you know, <laughs> a pastor is not a pastor. A pastor shouldn't be telling you know, the kids and the, the young teenagers that they shouldn't be having sex because they're going to have sex anyway. When she said this on the phone to me, you of all people know how I am. I said, let me tell you this. You don't know me. And I am a pastor that stands on the word of God. And the word of God says fornication is a sin. And I'm going to stand on the word of God. And I'm going to teach it that fornication is a sin. Whatever you do with your life is between you and God. But what I do with mine is between me and God. See, it's not about just making friends, people. Oh, God's going to bring the right people to you. You're going to have the right folks. You're going to have to wean out who is poison and who isn't. Sometimes you'll find yourself with only one or two. But that's all that matters because Jesus fulfills them all. <laughs> but sometimes you got to stand. Even in the midst of people telling you what you should do as a pastor. And I told this person on the phone. Don't you dare tell me I, I know the woman of God that I am. And I will stand on the word whether anybody likes it or not. And then she said, amen, amen, amen. I tell you this. We're in this time that the enemy is going to deceive you. Try. He's going to try every way. Physical, spiritual. With money. With finance, every part of your life, the enemy is going to try to deceive you. But saints of God, I tell you this. If you have the great one inside of you. No, I said, if you do. I, I said, if you have the great one inside of you, then the Bible says, then this scripture is for you. Greater is he that is in you 
than he that is in the world. And it doesn't matter what man says and it doesn't matter what the enemy comes and brings at you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I pray that you have made your decision this morning. This is, has nothing to do with Pastor Jimmy and I. Nothing to do with any of you. Nothing to do with faith in action. Who is it? Say it. Say it. Say it again. 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 Because it it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. It's for his glory. And I tell you, I pray to God that you made the right decision. If you didn't yet, all you got to do is say, Father, I give up my life. Simple. I give it up. I let it go. I don't want nothing else. I, want, I just want you, Father. Make the decisions for your families. Make the decision for your life. Many of us will see tomorrow. The life that we live today will determine our tomorrows. And many of us will not see tomorrow. The life that you live today will determine where you'll be and where you'll end up. So family, friends, faith in action. To God be all glory, honor, and praise. What a powerful message, Pastor Jeremy. Thank you so much for being the messenger of God. It is a, a very vital message in these days. Thank you so much for being obedient to God. And I want you to lift your hands up to the Father one more time. I'm never going back. I'm never going back. I'm never going back to the way it was. I'm never going back. I'm never going back. I'm never going back to the way it was. I just want you. My King, we thank you for your word and we thank you for every person, every soul on this live and those that is here. And I am declaring your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Deliver us from the evil one, my King. Protect us, our mind, our thoughts. Protect our bodies, but most importantly, God, protect our spirit. I ask that you give strength to everyone who made the decision today to go forward. Conviction if you need to, but Lord, empower them as you have graced us already. <clears throat> Your grace that empowers us to overcome sin. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your word. I thank you for your presence. And I thank you for who you are, my King. You are exalted, Jesus. And to you be all glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody say amen and amen. Now give him a 10-second clap of victory praise in your life for those uh, that you love, that will be set free in the name of Jesus. And for your life that is free in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I hope you enjoyed being in the presence of God. And I pray that the presence of God will go with you wherever you go. And it just wouldn't just be a moment, but will be a everyday lifestyle. Amen. This week, Tuesday. Tuesday live at 5. Pastor has been doing an amazing job, Pastor. Thank you so much um, for coming in um, at live at 5 as I was taking a couple weeks sabbatical. 
and I may just take one more week, but we'll see uh, about Pastor Jen. But anyway, I'm just joking. It's whatever God wants. But Tuesday live at 5, we are here to encourage you. Wednesday, Wednesday at 7 p.m., we have Pastor Nina, who is our youth pastor, that's going to be doing our Wednesday night um, service on this week, Wednesday at 7 p.m. And she's looking at me like, what? But you got to just be ready in and out of season. Thank you, Jesus. In fact, it ain't our words. It's his words anyway, so it doesn't matter. Right, Pastor Nina? You got anything to say to the Lord right in front of everybody in the world? Okay, you're ready. Okay. All right, you better get on her, okay, just in case. But other than that, this week, Sunday, 1030, we coming back on the live, winning souls for Jesus, winning souls for Jesus, winning souls for Jesus. So, without further ado, oh, one more thing. Place a prayer in our FIA War Room on the Facebook Live. Um, if you have any prayer requests, please, we have our fire starters. Our, and I tell you, they are on fire. Our fire starters are on fire. And so they are going to be going in and they're watching that. So they're going to be praying for you. If you have any uh, anything you want to say, you can message us. Go ahead and also like, follow, subscribe, Facebook page, Faith in Action Church of God Ministries, also on our YouTube page, Faith in Action Media Ministries, Instagram, Faith in Action Ministries, and I cannot breathe. Other than that, we are good. And it was a blessing to uh, see you on the live. Um, not see you on the live, but it was a blessing that we will... To have you join us on the live because of course we can't see you people but it was a blessing to see all of you here um amen and amen other than that go forward in the lord in the fear of the lord 